Welcome to The Body Nerd Show, empowering you with the super uncomplicated things you need to know about self-care and movement so that you too can wake up every day pain-free. I'm your host, Alexandra Ellis, and I'm a coach, writer, former yogi, kettlebell devotee, and 100% body nerd. So, are you ready? Let's get nerdy! Welcome back. You're listening to episode 19 of The Body Nerd Show. First of all, oh my goodness, we are almost to 20 episodes. Getting excited about that. And if you've been watching on Instagram stories, I'm going to apologize right now for the inevitable construction that is happening outside. We're getting some gas line construction on the street, which is great for, I guess, our gas lines. Not so great for podcast recording. I mean, they really are so insensitive. (laughs) But thankfully, they're only here during the workday, and they are not here in the evening time to disrupt sleep which is today's topic. So today we're going to talk about why you need more sleep right now and how you can actually get it, simple ways you can set yourself up for sleep success starting tonight, if you really need to take a nap, if naps are a thing, are they? Are they cool? Are they not cool? We'll talk about that. And the best sleep positions that won't leave you with a cranky neck or shoulder in the morning. And just as a reminder, show notes, fun links, free downloads, and the Body Nerds Facebook group all live over on aewellness.com slash podcast, and I'll leave that in the show notes. And there's links to come follow me over on Instagram. I'm Hala from Mala. Information about Movement Mavens, our membership community that gives you the plan, the tools, and the help to get stronger, more flexible, and feel amazing every single day. The latest blog posts and a free download with nine things to soothe yourself when you're in pain. So there's a lot of good stuff over at aewellness.com slash podcast. Make sure you go check it out. So why are we talking about sleep? Mostly because it's something that we all do. You can't not sleep and live to tell the story. I read a super interesting book called Why We Sleep, Unlocking the Power of Sleep and Dreams by Matthew Taylor, which if you are at all interested in the science of sleep, you absolutely must read this book. And I will link to that in the show notes as well. But it is fascinating. And it's also sciencey without being too sciencey. It's a great book I did read before I went to sleep at night. And it also helped me fall asleep at night because it was a little a little dense. Um, but even the author talks about the fact that you'll probably fall asleep while reading it and he's okay with that. Uh, also, if you listen to episode 16, when I talked with Jason Fitzgerald, he highlighted how important sleep was to your recovery and your training. And all in all, sleep speeds up recovery from inflammation, it stimulates muscle repair, it helps to restock your cellular energy. Honestly, if you are not sleeping a lot each night, and by a lot, I mean seven to eight hours, even nine hours would be great, you are doing yourself a great disservice. So I wanted to read you a little bit from Matthew Taylor's book on why we need sleep. First of all, two-thirds of adults throughout all developed nations fail to obtain the recommended eight hours of nightly sleep. I try to aim for seven and a half, and I'm going to be honest with you, there are some times where it's seven or six and a half, but I can tell you for sure that when I hit seven or more hours, I feel so much better. And if you're saying, Alex, I don't need that much sleep. I can get by on like four or five hours or maybe six hours. I got news for you. You're still a mammal and you still need sleep. And even if you have learned to get by on that little sleep, you actually need more. Here's what Matthew Taylor says. Routinely sleeping less than six or seven hours a night demolishes your immune system, more than doubling your risk of cancer. Insufficient sleep is a key lifestyle factor determining whether or not you will develop Alzheimer's disease. Inadequate sleep, even moderate reductions for just one week, disrupts blood sugar levels so profoundly that you would be classified as pre-diabetic. So honestly, if that's not inspiration or a scare tactic enough to get you to sleep, I don't know what else is. But let's all just agree to stop pretending that we can get by on four or five hours of sleep. It's not possible. You're a human. Then getting adequate sleep regularly is not only going to help your body, but 
obviously your brain. It enhances memory. It helps to make you more creative. So if you're trying to work through a problem at work, and even if you don't think that you are creative, trust me, you are. It helps to lower food cravings and balance your blood sugar. When you are underslept that next day, one of the reasons why you feel just ravenous and super hungry is because of your hunger hormones and the hormones that tell your body that you're full and your blood sugar are all disrupted. So if you are trying to be mindful of how you're eating and pay attention to what you're eating, make sure you're sleeping too, because that's just going to make the whole process even more challenging. As I mentioned, it helps you stay healthy by keeping your immune system in check and making sure that all your levels are in balance, and you're going to feel happier, less depressed, and less anxious if you're getting adequate sleep. One of the signs for myself of when I haven't gotten enough sleep, and usually it's an accumulation thing. It's not like, oh, you know, I slept four hours last night and now I'm super tired. Yeah, that happens. But also it's cutting away just a little bit. You know, it's half hour here, half hour there. And before you know it, over the course of the week, you've only slept six hours a night. And for me, that manifests as feeling really overwhelmed. I know when I'm feeling overwhelmed that it's not just work that I'm letting take over, but also that I probably need a nap and need to get to sleep. So I encourage you to think about it as well. What are the signs for you that you're underslept? And if once you know those signs, then you can be better at being proactive and not letting yourself get to that point. Because sleep debt is a thing. Just like I mentioned, it's not just one night of poor sleep, but the accumulation over a couple of nights of getting even just five, 10 minutes less of sleep that can negatively affect your brain and your body. So naps are actually a really, really good thing. I find that pretty much every weekend I've been taking a delicious nap. Not that naps can be delicious, but this nap is so good. Um, And we'll talk a little bit about sleep cycles and the optimum time for a nap. But napping is one way that you can catch up, so to speak, on your sleep. When it comes to learning and memorization, you won't ever get that memory back that's lost when you have nights of poor sleep, which I wish I could go back in time and tell my college age self that pulling all-nighters is probably the worst thing you can do for your memory, but you can improve going forward. So just really try to aim to hit that seven to nine hour mark every single night, because that's what's going to make the difference for your health, for your brain, for your body over and over and over and over again. So why do we feel sleepy? And I talked about this on episode 15 when I talked about why I don't drink coffee anymore. And I mentioned adenosine, which is a chemical in your brain that builds up and it's called sleep pressure when adenosine levels are high. Um, And eventually when that adenosine gets too high, you can't fight it anymore. So cold air conditioning, you know, blasting the AC in your car, drinking coffee, jumping around, all of those things might push off those feelings of sleep pressure temporarily, but the only thing to reset it is sleep. In Matthew Taylor's book, he talks about that sleep pressure and how we can kind of fool ourselves into thinking like, oh, we're not really sleepy. I can keep driving. But honestly, if you feel sleepy, go to sleep. That's the only thing that is going to truly reset that sleep pressure um, is a night of good sleep and sometimes even multiple nights. I will say the times where I have the most disruption in my sleep is when I'm traveling, especially across time zones, and I use my Fitbit to pay attention to sleep. I have a model that uh, tracks heart rate as well. So it's a little bit more accurate, I'd like to believe, as far as what sleep cycle you specifically are in. And I find that when I'm catching up on my sleep, especially when I've had a day or two of disrupted sleep, that I spend more time in deeper sleep as my body is trying to catch up. So that's another reason to use a fitness tracker, especially if you're interested in these types of um, you know, analytics and data, is paying attention to how you sleep. 
the one thing I have learned through my own practice and own exploration is that a sleep routine is the best thing that you can do for yourself as far as good sleep goes. When we're little babies, we put them on routines. We make sure they go to bed at the same time. They wake up at the same time and we that's totally accepted. And then for some reason, we become adults and we like to fight against that routine. So we stay up really late on the weekends and then Monday comes around and we're totally pooped. Part of that is because your circadian rhythm is that internal body clock that tells your brain when it's time to sleep. And it uses daylight to help synchronize and figure out where it is. It uses some even social cues. There's other ways that your brain and body can determine that it's time to go to sleep. And when we stay up real late on the weekends, that just messes with that circadian rhythm. So there's kind of a almost like a confusion, right? Your brain's trying to figure out, well, is it time to go to sleep? Is it not? I'm, you know, been I've been underslept the last few days. So having the, the same sleep time and wake time every single day can really help you keep a sleep routine and get better sleep every single night. I'm not going to lie, it's really boring. <laughs> I just had this realization, um, honestly, this week, because I used to get up at 6.30 every day. My husband is out of the house, usually between 6.30 and 7 on his way to work. And so I wanted to be up to say goodbye. And it just wasn't working for me. And so I changed my alarm to go off at 7. And honestly, just that half hour shift has made a huge difference. And a lot of that probably has to do with what sleep cycle my body is in at that time. Um, but now I get up at 7 a.m., whether it's the weekend or the weekday. So it does, I'm not going to lie, it does take some of the fun out of sleep. <laughs> but it's super important um, to have that regularity so that your body and brain and hormones know it's time to sleep at the right time. So there's a special part in your brain called the suprachiasmatic nucleus, and it sits right above your optic nerve. So that's the nerve that comes off your eyeballs into the brain. And it's sampling light from your optic nerve. So it knows, hey, it's nighttime. It's time to go to bed. And so when you go to sleep at the same time every night, that helps that rhythm to just be really locked in place and really stable so that you are able to wake up when you need to wake up but also are tired when you need to be tired. So one way to help hack this light relationship is to expose yourself to light both in the morning um, and evening time. So whether that's you know going outside when it's nighttime or going outside uh, as the sun is setting, but definitely getting outside at least once a day, preferably in the morning, to help stimulate that awakening um, and also give your body a snapshot or your brain, hey, it's daytime and we're going to be sleeping probably 10 hours from now. Also, you want to limit your blue light exposure in the evening. So that's anything with an illuminated screen, telephone, um, computer screens, television screens, even your lights emit some of that blue LED. And blue blockers are a special type of coating that can be put on your lens. I know um, the glasses I have can have that blue blocker added. You can buy blue blockers, probably even off Amazon, um, to help limit that amount of blue light, which might be something to consider if you are finding that you have a hard time going to sleep at night. I know they range from super expensive to not that expensive, so it might be worth exploring. Um, and I'd love to know what you think. So if you have any blue blockers that you love, share them with me and I'll share those resources in the uh, Body Nerd Facebook group. Another way to induce sleepiness at the right time or the time you need it to happen um, is with your body temperature. Uh, as you go to sleep or one thing that makes you sleepy is the body temperature cooling down. So if you take a warm shower before bed, your body starts that cooling down process, which can make you sleepy. And honestly, oh, it's one of the things I think messed with my hot yoga was that I would get super hot and I'd come out of hot yoga and my body would start cooling down and then I was so tired. So now I started taking a shower as quickly after so that I can bring that body temperature up with a little bit of a cold shower or excuse me, bring that body temperature down um, without getting too sleepy. So you might have heard of melatonin. 
shifting back to physiological sleep signals. Um, and melatonin is a signal to your body that sleep and nighttime, or specifically that nighttime is coming and it's time to start winding down. But it doesn't induce sleep itself. So if you take any melatonin supplements, it's great to take them 90 minutes to two hours before bed, which just kind of helps that whole getting ready for sleep process for your brain. But just remember, it's not a sleep aid per se. So it's not going to make you fall asleep, um, but it just helps your body to know sleep is coming soon. One of the ways I like to use melatonin is to take the melatonin. I like the the gummies from <laughs> Target. Um, and then my husband and I take our dog out on a walk, usually about 930 every night. And that's her schedule. It started out as ours, but now at 930, she's the one saying, mm, hello, it's time for my walk. So I take the melatonin and then we go on our last walk. So a little bit of movement is really good. It also helps that melatonin to just start its process. And again, the routine for sleep. Sometimes your sleep routine is less about the specifics of what you're doing and just the action of sleeping, right? I'm signaling to my body, hey, our last walk is happening. I just took some melatonin. I'm going to wash my face. Bedtime is coming. So the more you can stick to that routine, the easier it is going to be to fall asleep on a regular basis. So what about sleep position? Actually, I was kind of surprised. I love to nerd out about sleep and everybody I've asked about what questions they had related to sleep all came back to sleep position and if it really matters. And the answer is no, not really. What is comfortable is going to be best for you. But what you want to do is be in as neutral of a position as possible. So you want to have your head in line with your shoulders, whether you're laying on your back or you're laying on your side. Um, The one position I would recommend trying to steer clear from, if possible, is laying on your stomach because you have to have a huge, you know, range of motion in your head, that rotation, and then you stay there for a couple hours. So that would be the one position I would encourage you to try to steer clear from if possible. But if you're a stomach sleeper and you've always slept on your stomach and it doesn't cause you a problem, then keep on sleeping on. So that neutral position of your head being in line with your shoulders, your shoulders in line with your ribs, your ribs in line with your hips. If you're sleeping on your back, that's going to be no pillow which might be really disappointing. I'm sorry. Um, But that will help to keep your head and neck in better alignment and not push you forward into that forward head posture position, which I've talked about on the neck strengthening episode. If you are a side sleeper, make sure your pillow is supportive enough to keep that space between your ear and the top of your shoulder that would also be there if you were in standing in good posture. So if your pillow is too big, it'll push your head to one side. Um, And if it's too small, then your head will drop down towards the bottom shoulder. So you're trying to create that good posture and balance, whether you're sleeping on your side or on your back. And if you do keep waking up with neck and shoulder pain, uh, pay special attention to what you're doing with your arm while you sleep. So having the arm under the pillow, that's another position that can oftentimes create some discomfort in the morning because the arm goes into that shape under the pillow and then you stay there for a couple hours. So some of the tissues that normally are on stretch are now shortened um, and vice versa. So that can create some irritation. And I would say, um, you know, figure out a way to not sleep that way, which is really hard. Changing how you sleep because it's such a unconscious thing is really difficult. I like to use a body pillow um, and sometimes I'll even kind of prop myself up with pillows to keep myself in a more comfortable position. Uh, So experiment, play around. Um, I know there's a ton of different pillows available. Um, Even just mentioning this episode that I was recording it, I got a few recommendations for some pretty cool pillows. So again, send me your pillow recommendations. So what about sleep cycles? And if you've ever taken a nap, you know this to be true, right? A nap can either last 20 minutes or it's two hours and there is literally nothing in between. And the reason for that is that sleep cycles last about 90 minutes. And in that 90 minute period, you have what's called non rapid eye movement sleep and REM and you have REM sleep. So the NREM is light sleep and some deep sleep. 
And then you have your REM sleep, which is where dreams are happening um, and your brain is trying to work through things. Every single part of the sleep cycle is super important for your brain, for even like cleaning house in your brain. Um, Dreaming helps your brain work through problems that you might be worried about during the day, Uh, which last night I had this super weird dream that like my arm was broken and I wasn't even concerned about it. So um, if you do dream uh, interpretation, that's what it's called, dream interpretation, please, um, curious what that means. When you first get to sleep, though, more time is spent in that light or deep sleep. And that REM sleep, the rapid eye movement where the dreams are happening, tends to happen later in the cycle, which is why you usually wake up in the morning from a super good dream or maybe the weird dream, like the broken arm thing. I still don't know what that meant. So napping, like I mentioned, is really good. And the interesting thing is that biphasic sleep, which is what we did before, you know, lights were created and the industrial revolution happened, is where you tend to sleep six hours a night and then have that 90 minute nap in the afternoon. So mammals have been doing that for thousands of years. And the invention of electricity is what changed that. And cultures where napping still exists tend to live longer than those who are chronically sleep deprived. So if you have been dreaming of napping (laughs) and you haven't done it like go nap go do you go get a nap um and it's good for your health it really is so what can you do right now tonight to get some amazing sleep the first thing is get the heck off of screens break up with your phone i know it's hard you might be listening to this podcast and it's late at night but get off your screens at least 90 minutes before you go to sleep I know on the iPhone, there's a way to set it to night shift where it's a little bit more warm in color to limit some of that blue light. I'm sure on Android and other platforms or some other apps. Um, So if you absolutely must use your screen to like set your alarm or something like that, try to have it be as dim as possible. Getting a sleep mask is also fantastic because it creates total darkness. Um, I one time was staying in an Airbnb that I thought was haunted, so I left all the lights on, and my sleep mask allowed me to sleep through the night, even though it was really bright. So I don't recommend leaving all the lights on, but you know, any lights from outside, even the light from your alarm clock can trick the brain into thinking it's wake time. So get a sleep mask. My favorite is from a company called Manta, and I'll link to my uh, I'll link to that in the show notes and give you a coupon code to save ten percent off your uh, Manta sleep mask. Try taking melatonin before bed, followed by a walk, and you want to do that about two hours before you're planning on going to sleep. You might even consider meditating before sleep. I know the Calm app has some really cool nighttime meditations um, and also sleep stories, which are just monotonous stories to help you fall asleep. I've used those before. Um, A noise machine is another great thing. Uh, When I can't sleep, my favorite noise is a dishwasher, which is weird, but it works. So why fight with what works? You might even consider doing some body work or self-massage before sleep, massaging your neck right before you crawl into bed, honestly, especially with those therapy balls, is going to help you fall asleep so quickly and stay asleep. And then get up and outside into the daylight on a regular basis so that your physiology and your biology know that it's daylight so that they can better figure out when it's nighttime and time to get to sleep. So those are my best tips for a great night's sleep, but I'm really curious what yours are too. So give me a call on the Body Nerd Show hotline at 818-396-6501 and let me know your best tips for amazing sleep. Really curious to know what kind of cool things you guys are doing out there in the world, and I might even share it on a future episode of the Body Nerd Show. So here's to asking better questions, moving more, getting nerdy, and sleeping a lot, and napping, I think, for sure. If you enjoyed this week's episode, make sure you hit that subscribe button so you never miss a future episode. And you can even head on over to Apple Podcasts and leave a review. It helps other body nerds find the show. So please, five stars or more. 
Just kidding. You can only leave five stars. Uh, come on over to Instagram and hang out. I'm at Hala for Mala. I love IG stories. So tag me and let me know what your favorite part of this week's episode was. I love seeing body nerds being nerdy out in the world. And help me spread the word that your body is cool and you can change the unchangeable no matter what it is or however long you've been dealing with it. I don't know if you guys can hear that, but Ella is whining, which means it's time for me to go. I'll talk to you next week. Have a great week. Life without pain is possible. And if you're ready to break up with all the things that are only giving you temporary relief, I've got just a thing. Head on over to bodynerdshow.com to download a checklist with nine simple things to soothe yourself when you're in pain. It doesn't have to be complicated and it won't take you more than 15 minutes a day. Thank you.